Um, my name is Holly Richter. I'm a urogynecologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, I'm honored to be here in this esteemed group uh, talking about evolving surgical treatment approaches for fecal incontinence. For those of you that um, did the workshop, I'm pretty much doing the same talk that I did before, um, mainly because we kind of we were uninformed on what exactly we were going to do for the workshop for the roundtable, but. Um, I hope you stay anyway and, and listen again. You may think of something else to, to ask or think about. Um, learning objectives for today, to understand that conservative approaches to treatment of fecal incontinence, incontinence are considered first line. I have colleagues, um, just like Julia, that I work with, that I send my patients to, because even if they're considering having surgical intervention, uh, the education, the strategies that they get with behavioral therapy, they use for a lifetime. Um, I hope we appreciate that the optimal treatment regimen may be a complex combination of various non-surgical and surgical approaches. And again, Julia alluded to that as well. Um, I'd like to present an evidence and case-based surgical treatment approaches for fecal incontinence. I think it's, it's pretty exciting that um, there are increasing innovative developments, both surgically and non-surgically, for the treatment of fecal incontinence. So um, the problem with these innovations and these new treatments is often um, it's very hard to compare outcomes across modalities because, again, as uh, Julia alluded to, we don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials. Um, and the studies that are out there, the prospective cohort studies, case series, often have different primary outcome measures. They uh, do their primary outcomes at different time points. So it's really hard sometimes to get a sense of efficacy of one treatment approach, uh, especially surgical, um, over another. And I think this is the main take home from the Brown uh, Cochrane Review on Surgery for um, fecal incontinence. So I'm going to start off with a case. Uh, we've got a 55-year-old female, pair 3013. She has a five-year history of fecal incontinence and anal rectal urgency. She has incontinence of both liquid and solid stool and gas, despite a credible attempt at management with behavioral therapy. She's had three vaginal deliveries, the largest is about 3,700 grams, so nothing abnormal there. Um, however, she did have a forceps delivery and did describe having a lot of stitches um, at the time of the first baby. She describes symptoms of alternating constipation and diarrhea. She is obese, um, and she has had a cholecystectomy. On physical examination and testing, she has decreased anal tone. She has intact reflexes, kind of a dovetail appearance to the anal verge. Her perineal body appeared to be about two centimeters in thickness. However, she had a lot of redundant skin on there as well. She had reasonable isolation with a decreased squeeze pressure activity, good relaxation. And on anal manometry, had an uh, anal resting tone of about 25 millimeters of mercury, using kind of 40 as the lowest end of normal. Um, she had a squeeze to 55 millimeters, millimeters of mercury. We'd like to see a doubling, like to see it over 100 millimeters of mercury. She had normal sensation, a compliance of 200 cc's, and a normal rare. On end anal ultrasound, um, as you can see, she has uh, an intact internal anal sphincter, but a disrupted external anal sphincter. So what are the causes of um, direct sphincter injury? Probably the most common cause is obstetric anal sphincter injury. I think we all know this. Um, however, um, other um, things can occur, such as at the time of anal surgery or rectal surgery. And this picture here kind of gives the nice um, pictorial of the, of the dovetail uh, sign that you see in women that may have a significant anal sphincter injury. And I want to clarify what we're going to describe here is a sphincteroplasty. And the term sphincteroplasty is used to describe a secondary or delayed reconstruction of the anal sphincter musculature. Um, injury to which has either not been recognized, that is an obstetric anal sphincter injury that may not have been recognized, or perhaps she, it was recognized, she had a repair, uh, however it fell apart maybe uh, at the time of healing. Um, we know these occur because um, uh, a secondary analysis of a childbirth and pelvic symptom study that we did through the Pelvic Floor Disorders Network showed that among women who had a sphincter tear repair at the time of delivery, 
35% of them, we followed them prospectively, 35% of them continued to have an eye internal anal sphincter gap, and of those women, the majority also had external anal sphincter gaps um, at both six and 12 months. So what do we do at the time of surgery? Um, uh, if we're not doing any other kind of vaginal repairs, well, typically, you can see here uh, the area of the anal verge. We'll do a semilunar incision around the anal verge area, mobilize that nicely. Usually, you can inject that up well so that it's a fairly avascular plane. With the use of Metzenbaums, I typically create anal sphincter pits laterally and then go down with an Alice clamp um, to get the sphincter. Um, and the sphincter, often you, you look for that shiny white capsule around the sphincter. And what I tend to do is bring it, kind of mobilize it a bit from the uh, surrounding connective tissue and try and get um, as much over um, each other as you can. I use a PDS suture on that, and I'll also try and get some internal sphincter. So what's the data uh, on sphincterplasties? Um, I think in general it reflects in the short term probably 70 to 80% of patients uh, reflect symptom improvement. However, I think, as most of us know, long-term success tends to deteriorate over time, uh, with 20 to 67 percent of um, uh, success rate uh, up to five years, and even lower uh, after 10 years. Oh, geez, I'm using the, uh, I'm just using the arrow. Is that a, I'm sorry. So um, Glasgow and Lowry had a systematic review that was published in DCR in 2012, took 16 studies, put those patients together, had about 900 uh, patients, um, and looked at outcome data. And you know, good, how do you define good? It's, it was different success, um, decrease in um, uh, incontinence episodes, improvement on some type of subjective measure, all of these meant good. Um, however, these outcomes did tend to decrease over time. So in summary, uh, probably about two-thirds uh, of women report improvement um, after an anal sphincter repair. Um, the studies to date reflect um, um, mainly recall type uh, symptomatology. Um, if you look at the literature, there's no factor that's significantly associated with a worse outcome. I truly think this is still a very appropriate first-line attempt um, as uh, for women with a major sphincter defect. Um, it helps restore the sphincter to a circumferential configuration. Often it helps build up the perineal body. The, the patient feels like her anatomy is improved. Um, as you know, the most common complication, as with any wound, um, uh, is an infection. Um, I really think in terms of the sphincter, it, it's to me is the optimal uh, kind of orthopedic model. You fix the muscle, you, you, you fix the rotator cuff injury, you let it heal, and then you go to rehab to build strength and function. And I think that really is something that we need to um, think about with the anal sphincter. And just as a quick aside, uh, I did have a video here um, with an anal sphincter uh, injury repair. We know uh, uh, obstetric anal sphincter injury incurs in up to 9% of vaginal deliveries. Um, up to 11% of permipparous women may have an occult injury. Um, the, the data, there's data looking to see that end-to-end -end is a good way to go. There's data to show that overlapping is a good way to go. I think you just want to make sure you get that sphincter together um, with integrity. Uh, and we know that women that have obstetric anal sphincter injuries um, are twice as likely to have postpartum fecal incontinence. And very recently, we looked at a series of over 350 women that had OASIs. Um, and fecal incontinence and anal incontinence symptoms in these women um, are, are reasonably high. Um, fecal incontinence at 6, 12, and uh, 24 weeks were varied from 4 to 9 percent. But if you look at anal incontinence at 24 weeks, um, this occurs in up to 24 percent um, of patients, and fecal urgency at 24 weeks is in greater than 20 percent of uh, patients. And as you know, fecal urgency is, is a modifiable uh, risk factor for fecal incontinence. However, if you look at other data, um, as I quote here from Baruca, uh, many women do not have symptoms until two to three decades down the road. They're able to compensate in some manner. So let's say you, you do a, um, done a sphincter repair, or this woman really, she has an intact sphincter. What other modalities exist, and what are the evidence for, um, for efficacy? So we're going to look at a few other things. 
Let's uh, take a look at case two. So we have a 67-year-old, a little older, uh, has a seven-year history of fecal incontinence. She has incontinence of liquid solid stool three times per week, necessitating constant pad use. She's scared to leave her home. She's had a sphincter repair. She's tried behavioral therapy, other PT strategies, pays attention to her diet, has tried uh, the use of Imodium, other medications, but there's still room for improvement. A recent two-week di diary revealed nearly daily bowel movements with leakage two times the first week and three times week two. She does have a history of hypertension and she's had a hysterectomy. Physical exam revealed decreased rectal tone, intact reflexes, good isolation, good reasonable squeeze activity. Manometry, show, manometry showed a resting tone of about 40 millimeters of mercury, a squeeze to 70. Uh, she had normal sensation. And endane ultrasound showed an intact uh, internal and external anal sphincter. And she's thinking, I'm just gonna get a colostomy and get fixed. So what other, other things are available? Um, probably for many of us, we're, we're looking at doing sacral nerve stimulation. Um, it has many, many potential targets, including uh, voluntary somatic, afferent sensory, uh, and efferent autonomic uh, nerve targets. There's even studies that show that rectal blood flow is increased after, um, with inner stim therapy. I think in general, the way it works is by decreasing episodes of spontaneous sphincter relaxation and also somewhat interrupts the content, uh, constant sensory input to the rectum uh, via neural reflexes. I'd, I would um, recommend uh, actual staging in both stage one and stage two, take her to the OR, do it under fluoroscopic guidance, look for your um, bellows and your toe flicks. Um, I usually do it up to a month of a bowel diary ahead of time as well as post stage one um, and then stage two if they have a 50% uh, reduction in fecal incontinence episodes. And just to summarize the data quickly, if you look at uh, intent to treat type data, obviously that, that data really shows both short and long term um, efficacy rates of about 50%. However, if you look at women that are successfully treated, so they're successfully implanted, um, rates are up in the 80% range from short, um, uh, medium, and long term. And in fact, sustained benefit has been uh, documented up to 14 years out uh, in greater than 80% of patients. As with all surgical uh, approaches, there are adverse events we need to talk to our patients about. Uh, with sacral nerve stem, most of these occur within the first year of implantation, including device pain, paresthesias. Um, uh, really, there's, there's a lot less of this with the new techniques that, that, that we're using now, um, and infection rates are markedly reduced as compared to uh, 20 years ago, down to um, about the less than 10% range. So what about, what else do we have in our armamentarium? Anybody here do the artificial bowel sphincter? Um, the artificial bowel sphincter is um, uh, a potential uh, for use in our patients with refractory fecal incontinence. As you know, it's comprised of an inflatable cuff, inflatable cuff that's put around the anal canal, which is connected via a pump that's usually in the labia to a pressure regulating balloon that's usually in the prevesical space. Um, again, success rates range depending on your definition of success and what types of subjective and objective outcomes there are, but typically range from 50 to 70% or so. Um, and again, we have to describe complications. Probably the most common reason for surgical revision is device malfunction with micropores being uh, formed with leakage. Uh, most commonly caused by repetitive pumping up and letting down, and there's cuff fatigue that ensues. The most common uh, cause for explantation is erosion. As you can see from these various uh, studies, erosion rates range from less, less than 10% to about 25%, uh, but even a bigger cause is infection, which ranges from less than 5% um, up to 60% in uh, one study. Anal slings, um, Dr. Zucci uh, reported on longer term outcomes of anal slings. As you know, their development kind of followed a parallel course as slings that are used for a urinary incontinence. 
Um, the transform study, longer term outcomes were reported here. Uh, one year outcomes were, were, were reported in March in Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. This was a multi-center perspective study, single arm, open label. Primary outcome was a 50% reduction of incontinence at, um, episodes over two weeks. Um, the N of this study was 152. Um, the prior, uh, other important secondary outcomes included uh, decrease in fecal incontinence days, urgency, symptom severity, quality of life. And the surgery, again, very kind of similar markings. If for those of you that may have done a, used uh, the old ProLift uh, mesh kits, you mark la over and down from the anal verge area. The sling fits up underneath the anus, kind of following the course of the puba rectalis. Um, and once it's in there, then you use an introducer up in the transobturator area, just like with the transobturator midurethral slings. And as you can see, you bring it down uh, lateral to the vagina, down to um, the incision that's made uh, in the perianal area, and then the bring the sling up around there. Um, the study is basically the mean age of patients is about 60, a uh, little bit overweight. The majority are Caucasian and postmenopausal. Surgery time itself is pretty short, and blood loss um, described in the study is pretty low. Um, it was um, devised as an outpatient procedure, although you can see the range that the patients are in-house um, varies. Um, they reported no visceral uh, injuries or perforations. And as you can see, the primary outcome, which was at 12 months, uh, nearly 70% of patients had a 50% or more reduction uh, in fecal incontinence episodes. Uh, and in terms of secondary outcomes, um, the FI episodes per week decreased from um, nine per week down to two. And there was a significant improvement in quality of life as well um, on the FI, as measured on the FIQOL. Again, talking about surgery, you always have to talk about adverse events. The largest adverse event being pelvic pain. Uh, 17 of these um, resolved with no treatment. 29 were treated with medical therapy. 10 persisted at one year. None were classified as serious adverse events. And there were no mesh erosions or extrusions. So I'm gonna finish up really quickly with a few other um, novel type treatments. Uh, radio frequency therapy is out there. This involves a four quadrant deployment of nickel titanium electrodes that go through the anorectal mucosa to the underlying uh, muscle and connective tissue. And radio frequency is used to get a temperature up to 65 to 85 degrees Celsius and essentially cooks the underlying connective tissue, causes denaturation and stricturing in this area. Very similar to the approach for uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, there is a long-term study, five-year study, where uh, the Wexner score was significantly improved. Uh, but as you can see, that N is uh, of 19. And there are no uh, comparative studies with this um, treatment modality. PTNS, um, well known to everybody, I think, in the room for refractory urgency urinary incontinence, is used in uh, Europe for fecal incontinence, is not FDA approved. Uh, in the U.S. for fecal incontinence, very similar to um, OAB directed toward the, the same um, um, nerve roots uh, as in OAB uh, state, uh, patients. Um, with respect to data, the largest prospective study included 115 patients with a median follow-up of 20, uh, 26 months, and this reported 52% of patients achieving a greater than or equal to 50% reduction um, in fecal incontinence episodes. And as you know, um, or may have heard, um, very uh, recently the first multicenter RCT of PTNS um, with um, sham electrical uh, stimulation was just reported by Knowles and basically showed no difference um, between PTNS and sham electrical therapy uh, with respect to the treatment of fecal incontinence. This is why we need RCTs. Um, many of you are probably acquainted with the non-animal sodium hyaluronate uh, dextranomers. In the U.S., this is called Celesta, kind of a bulking, just like you would do a periurethral bulking. This is done in the office. Um, really is painless if you get that, make sure you get that needle above the dentate line, which you can easily, easily see with an anoscope. Um, there's one pivotal trial, 206 patients, um, randomized trial, uh, at three months, um, 
um, um, there was no difference um, between sham and active treatment. However, at six months there was, and my arrows kind of screwed up there, but there was a significant difference at six months uh, between uh, active therapy and sham. And again, AE-wise, uh, the most common adverse events were pain um, and bleeding. Try and maybe end. Let's end. Um, Ba basically, other investigational things occur um, are the magnetic anal sphincter as well as autologous myoblast injection, which Dr. Zucci uh, commented on uh, earlier today, which is quite exciting. So obviously, final consideration is colostomy. There, there are uh, studies that do show improved quality of life um, with colostomy. And if you think your day is bad, I think this guy's day is even worse. <laughs> so thank you for your attention.